desire that the Holy Spirit be our teacher. I, I have some objectives for today's lesson. This is what I hope that we can accomplish. You may not agree. First, I'd like that all of us be able to explain the four chosen texts that were dealt with in the reader titled Supernatural. And secondly, that we would be able to affirm what the Bible says about a spiritual realm. And thirdly, as our practice, begin to believe the weird parts of the Bible. Because the weird parts of the Bible are often picked up in the New Testament as an explanation of the power of the gospel in both the human and the spiritual realms. All right, I wanted to remind you that you can download the outline that we're following today. Secondly, these PowerPoint slides, they're free, available, you can download those as well. From this site, if you'd like to take note of that, we'll try to keep this site updated with everything we hand out in this uh, course. And if I put any links to other material that might be of interest to you, you can find them on that site. But I wanted to start with a bit of known human history. So the Bible places its mythology, that is its spirit talk, always within the context of human history. And the fascinating thing about biblical history is that it is increasingly supported by evidence from archaeology. Shalmanzer III of Assyria was a king reigning between 859 and 824 BCE. Or was that his lifetime? One or the other. And the Assyrian Empire was on the rise in the 9th century of BCE, displacing Egypt. Egypt was the, the imperial power even over the Middle East, including Israel, for most of its history. In other words, Egypt and then Assyria were the com comparable to the United States role in the world today. So, let's um, a few things about him. The empire is called Assyria in history and in the Bible. This was the imperial threat over the Middle East, over Israel and Judea, the northern and southern kingdoms. Capital was at the city of Nineveh, and at this point, it's King Shalmaneser. The Syria is another country mentioned in the text. Syria is a smaller uh, kingdom, nearer to Israel, of which the capital was and still is Damascus. The king at this time was named Ben-Hadad. Then the third power mentioned here is that of Israel. But remember, by this time of history, the former Israel had been divided into two kingdoms. The northern Israel retains the name Israel. The southern kingdom takes the name Judea, hence the term Jew. And fourthly, there was Judea, the southern kingdom, with its royal city or capital in Jerusalem. And the king's name will be Jehoshaphat. God is the guardian. The darker green area is Assyria at the time that the story takes place. And the lighter green is what the Assyrian Empire will become in the following decades. Your book dealt with the story of 1 Kings, chapter 22, in which Ahab was going to attack Ben-Hadad. And he wanted Jehoshaphat of Judah to come help him to take back a city that had been captured by Syria some years earlier. And so when the two kings met together, they did what kings do. They say, they ask, well, should we not consult with the prophets and see if the prophets could give us, predict a good outcome? And of course, all the prophets, they knew what was expected of them, so they all predicted a favorable outcome. But um, Jehoshaphat, he, he thought, well, do you have any other prophets here? And, well, yeah, there, there's another one. His name is Micaiah, but I don't like him because he doesn't predict things the way I want them to turn out. <laughs> there seemed to be an ancient belief that the prophets had influence over the gods. Not only got information from them, but would inform them 
as to what they should do. <coughs> Somebody read aloud for us verses 19 and 20. Micaiah continued, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? Uh, the historical situation, which is known from archaeology, and then the story is recounted in the Bible, in the midst of which we have reference to the spirit world. What's the principle we could draw about the role of the spirit world as reported in the Bible, contrasting with the mythology of pagan nations, or of the spiritism practiced in our own country? Better listen to God. Well, better listen to God for sure. But everything in the Bible is tied to real, verifiable history. And so whatever's going on in the spirit world is not just simply stories to scare children <laughs> or to explain the unseen in a pre-scientific context. So the Bible is, is amazing in that regard. Oh, the name, Yahweh, yes. I think all of us are aware that in our English Bibles, when we see the Lord in capital letters, it's referring to the name of the God of the Bible, which for centuries was considered to be non-pronounceable, or could pronounce it, but we don't. And so even our Protestant Bibles for centuries refused to translate the name of God. And then we have the multitudes of heaven, the Saba, that is the hosts, are mentioned here. Now one of the concepts that we looked at last week is referenced here. So what we see is Yahweh, or the Lord, surrounded by a crowd of spirit beings, and he is talking with them. They are conversing. Now Yahweh always knows what he's going to do. But he includes these beings in the discussion. Now, he also knows what's going to happen in our lives. Nevertheless, he includes us. So we're going to try something a little different this morning. All of you have somebody seated near you. And what I'd like you to do, if you will bear with me, is look to either side of you and form a tiny group of two, three, or four at the most and take up to four minutes and read the passage together, either from the book or open the Bible. And then uh, let everyone make observations about what was happening with the divine council in the unseen realm. And then after you have made your observations, try to reply to these two queries. How does Yahweh make use of lying spirits? Ah. And secondly, how do actions taken in the unseen realm play out in the visible world? So after about four minutes, I'm going to ask several of you to tell me what the others that you discussed with observed. So try this. <laughs> spirit is really a lying spirit he was just he made the suggestion he's and then he goes out and God says 
yeah, great, go do it. But he's okay. not a lying spirit, like, you know, telling an untruth, he's just... Right. Well, you yeah, know, we got, we got out of it, you know, when they were having this, you know, conversation on this thing, that this spirit offered that he would go down and entice him. And basically, a hog doesn't want to believe anything that Makai, you know, tells him because he never tells him what he wants to hear. Right. So the spirit will go down and he will, in essence, be a lying spirit and tell, you know, a hog what he wants to hear, which is going to bring about what, what, what's going to happen to him anyway. Uh, other observations? There are a lot of folks <coughs> making uh, different suggestions back and forth. Yeah. So there's a lot of opinions. All right, how do actions in the unseen realm play out in the visible world? I guess the question is actually the answer itself. How is it that Orthodox Christian Russia right now is at war with Orthodox Christian Ukraine, <laughs> whereby tens of thousands of Christian young men are killing each other by the hundreds a day? How do we explain that in merely natural terms? The spirit world is involved. There's a spirit world behind it. And it should be obvious to anyone who reads their Bible. And so the lying spirits or spirits fomenting lies are indeed lying to the leaders of the world. The question I have to bring back to you though is, does this story make God, Yahweh, to be the father of lies? Is it possible that in the divine council there are both holy spirit beings and fallen spirit beings who had not yet been cast out of heaven? In fact, when the New Testament talks about Satan being thrown out of heaven and his angels with him, one of the questions is, has that already happened or is it happening constantly, or is that yet to happen in the future? In any event, in our story, the Divine Council uh, still seems to include spirits who are willing to tell lies. Anyway, let's shift over to Jude 1.6. Jude, as well as Peter, by talking about angels who did not stay in their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And ancillary literature, such as the book of Enoch, tried to explain that these were what the Bible calls <clears throat> the sons of God, named in Genesis 6-2. The sons of God, the B'nai Ha'elohim, saw that the daughters of men were good in appearance, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Now, just an observation from Hebrew, that phrase, B'nai Ha'elohim, remember what we learned about this, uh, this noun? What is its grammatical form? It's a plural. However, <coughs> it's only a plural in meaning when it's used with a plural verb. If the same noun is used with a singular verb, such as Elohim created, then uh, obviously it's a singular. And so you could you translate here the sons of God, but you can equally and grammatically translate sons of the gods, meaning these belonged to a class of beings <coughs> that were called sons, that is, created beings. So, you can take it either way, but that's not our point here today. So, um, and the, since that was the understood meaning in the first century in the surrounding culture and literature, it's very possible that Jude understood the same meaning. That is, he had the Genesis event in mind. These were fallen angels, the Jewish writers said, who left their assigned place to 
at least make use of women for the creating of new beings. Nothing explicit is said in scripture except that these beings used women to engender new children called the Nephilim. The only thing that writers and Bible readers could imagine was that those angels were cohabiting with the women. But today, from our scientific perspective, we know that you don't have to do that anymore. You can actually cause new life to grow within the uterus without the intervention of us. And some of those beings, of course, are called chimera. You can take genetics from two different species, you can now combine them, and you can actually grow the embryoid. Scientists usually destroy them once they've proven their point, but when they allow them to grow to maturity, they're a very odd looking creature, usually with low survivability. In any event, we have in the Apocrypha, this way, the Apocrypha are what? Non-canonical. Non-canonical meaning we don't think they belong in the canon, that is in the Bible. However, for centuries, most Protestant Bibles actually contained the Apocrypha. And our church fathers in the Protestant period, Christians were still reading the Apocrypha to gain a lot of insight into the history, for example, the Maccabean history behind the first Jewish revolt, which may be alluded to in the book of Daniel. There is a book in there called The Wisdom of Solomon. That's its title. There's a number of short uh, psalms that are not included in what today we accept as the Psalter. Where it says, Sudden and unexpected fear overwhelmed them. And whoever was there fell down and thus was kept shut up in a prison not made of iron. They were seasoned and endured the inescapable fate for which one chain of darkness they were all bound. So, from whence did Jude draw his language? Probably from the Apocrypha. That is, other Jewish writings that Christians may or may not care to read. Let's do another discussion. You did guys head for that one so well. Form our tiny groups, make some observations, and try to reply to these queries. Where were those angels to start with? And then, where are they now? In addition to your other observations. So, you have four minutes. Read the verse. Uh, Welcome back. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, let's hear from this group over here. What did you guys observe? Well, it wasn't angels that it wasn't uh, a practice of the angels to do what it suggests yeah. that they did with the human women. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that was not their proper place. And that's I think where they left their habitation or the type of being that they were. Hmm. Okay. Or a part of it. Hmm. Right. Okay. Mm. And now where are they now? <laughs> all right. Um, that, all right. Let's let someone else answer that. Another group. What is your observation or your replies to my queries? He's kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness. So right. we're looking at gloomy darkness is basically at this point, anywhere outside of heaven, you know, God is the light, he's in heaven, everywhere else, so not really in a designated place, but in, but not, not within heaven, okay, until the judgment day, which we, we're looking at when Christ returns, and, and we have the day, judgment day, then they would, they would uh, be brought back before, right, yeah. Uh, the pre-Christian Jewish writers had two takes on where this gloomy darkness is. Some said that's the atmosphere around the earth. And so you have in Ephesians chapter 2, for example, a reference to the God, the, the, uh, the power of the air. But others said, well, no, that's the, that's Sheol, that's the uh, underworld. In any event, it's the place of the dead. 
And so the particular angels we're talking about here, they're in bondage someplace. They're no longer, have, as far as we know, have no longer have access to us. Unless they actually do. But that's not <laughs> answered. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to take the term angels. Remember last time we dealt with a list of divine beings from Dr. Heiser's books that are mentioned by categories in the Hebrew Bible. But when the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, called the Septuagint, they did not translate all of those technical terms from Hebrew. And so very often, the Septuagint will just say, the angels. But they don't necessarily mean good ones. Often they meant fallen ones, who are rebellion against Yahweh. And the New Testament then, quoting from the Septuagint, or using its language, often does the same thing. So in that sense, it's le the New Testament is less precise. Assuming that you know the Old Testament, or the First Testament, in any event, what we're doing here today is exactly what Christians have been doing for centuries, trying to understand what this is all about. Well, we have a parallel text in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. My translation here makes spirit capitalized, assuming this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, or Jesus, uh, in a Trinitarian sense. <clears throat> However, trans an alternate translation says, he was put to death in his body, but made alive in his spirit. In other words, while his body lay dead in his tomb, he himself went someplace else, on a, to perform a particular task. Why would Peter even mention such a thing, making this one of the weirdest texts in the entire New Testament? Except that another book that was widely read in that period of time, and today is widely read amongst Christians, is the old text called the Book of Enoch, or First Enoch in which Enoch himself is empowered by God, assuming that this is the Enoch of the Bible, who was taken up without death, that he traveled around the created universe, visiting every place, including the visible and invisible world, and he even went down into Hades, where these guys were in chains. And they say to Enoch, we really recognize now how much we messed up. What we did was wrong. Would you please go intercede on our behalf with Yahweh to see if we can get out of here? And so Enoch goes up into heaven. He presents his petition before Yahweh. And Yahweh listens to him and just says, no. Okay, so Enoch goes back down to the underworld and he makes proclamation to the spirits in prison saying, no you'll never get out of here. And so now, Peter, he takes this idea, at least it's a parallel thought, and he explains, well, somebody did go down into the, into the abyss and make a proclamation to the disobedient spirits. It wasn't Enoch, it was Jesus. So Jesus is the fulfillment, not this other guy you've been reading about. So in any event, there are three main views as to what's going on here. And you'll find these in theology books. First, that between his death and resurrection, Jesus preached to the dead in Hades, or hell, the realm of the dead. And this was the view of the so-called early church fathers. So the first Christians for a few centuries believed this must be what's in view. But eventually, uh, other views emerged. The uh, main one is that of the reformers who started the Protestant movement, that Christ preached through Noah to people in Noah's day, the view of the reformers. In other words, it wasn't Jesus died in resurrection. You know, 
but rather the spirit of Jesus that was somehow back there in the First Testament times, and that was the spirit that was preaching through Noah. May be true. I myself am not well enough informed to be sure. And thirdly, that before or after his resurrection, Jesus proclaimed triumph over the fallen angels, which is the view of most scholars today. I am not well enough informed to dictate to myself or to you guys which of these three views, or some other view you may hold, would be the best. However, that which is most consistent with historical use of scripture and the historical context of First Peter is probably number one. Anyway, let's do this again. Let's form our little groups, take up to four minutes to read the passage aloud, make your observations, and if you wish, reply to these queries. <coughs> First, where did Jesus go make proclamation? And secondly, what had been those spirits' crime? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the voice is all died down. <laughs> all right, yes, please. Um, in Luke 18, mm -hmm. it talks about the bosom of Abraham. Right. So do you have any more input on the bosom of Abraham? Because that's where I feel Christ went and redeemed those that were, or brought with him from a holding place. Right, yes. Uh, we agree with you that Christ has removed all the righteous dead out of Sheol and taken them into the uh, New Jerusalem, uh, Mount Zion in, in, in the heavens. Uh, however, that's not mentioned in this passage. That's not what it's referring to? Um, well, it's connected. And we'll come to that if the Lord gives us help and Elders don't shut down this course. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, other observations? Kind of, kind of reading through this with other reading and studies that we've done, right. you know, in our Thursday men's group, right. Christ died on the cross, and then, you know, he was on the third day, that, that in between the time that he was in Hades, and his proclamation to... The spirits there was that the battle, the, the war, the battle has been won. Yes, you have been defeated. Right. Because you know, in reading, yeah, and even in the Old Testament, where prophets had made mention of the one, the chosen one, that he had to die. But all the, all the thing that was going on with Jesus mm -hmm. in the New Testament, mm -hmm. they didn't realize you know, that pushing to right. have his right. execution, and that was already God's plan, yes. and their defeat. Yes, exactly. Uh, so th this kind of ties in with that, that, yeah. that Jesus, in that three days, would have would have descended into Hades and made proclamation yes. that, yeah. the, that the war, that the battle yeah. is over. That's right, yeah. And uh, so, by his death, he has disempowered <coughs> the spirit world. They are no longer have any legitimate claim of authority over the redeemed. That is, those who are regenerate and belong to Jesus Christ. Whereby, the book of Ephesians can make the observation that God is showing forth his wisdom in the church to the spirit world. In other words, you guys, you're losing your job. I'm giving you notice. Good question. That was these spirits in prison. Do you think they'll come back? Oh, you don't think they'll be at the end of time? Uh, come back and using modern uh, gynecological science be able to create another 
uh, semi-human race of strong guys. You know, the uh, transhuman uh, soldiers will be able to conquer the world. Well, if Satan, after being put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, after he is freed and allowed to change a whole bunch of people, okay. why couldn't he get those guys to get them out with him to join? Right. This is one reason why commentators suggest that when the pit is opened in the book of Revelation and the locusts come up out of the, out of the pit, those may be these guys who are set free for an end time task of completely deceiving those who are destined for the wrath of God. That's one eschatology. We have one a fourth text when the king of Syria was discovered that every time he tried to do something against Israel, the Israelites were always able to counter him. And so he called in his chief advisors and asked, who amongst us are spies that are telling the Israelite king every move we make? And his advisor said, well, uh, here they have a prophet who tells King Ahab everything that you even mention in your bedroom. <laughs> and so he said, well, where is that guy? Well, he's at Dothan down in Israel, which was about 10 miles south of Samaria. And so he sent a contingent of his army down to Dothan, surrounded the town. And when the mo in the morning, the young servant came out to wash his face, that's an Africanism. That's the first thing you do in the morning. <laughs> the, the army all around the town, he comes back in and it, he reports to Elisha what he'd just seen. And Elisha's reply was, somebody read those verses for us. Aloud. Do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Yes. Elijah prayed and said, Oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. God opened his eyes of the young man and he saw the whole mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around the way. Read this passage again together to each other. And if you can't think of anything else, try to uh, reply to this. Who comes to the rescue of God's servants? And how can humans see spiritual beings? that you found particularly interesting, startling, or objectionable? Well, I guess being that yes, it's Elijah is one of God's prophets, right. and that God communicates, gives him visions, and mm -hmm. so he would, he would obviously not be afraid with, with what's coming around him, because yeah. he sees, whereas, you know, a lot of times, you know, God doesn't always reveal to us mm -hmm. what's in and around us, yeah. but through Elijah's prayer, that God would make it clear right. and open his servant's eyes that yeah. he could see. Obviously, what was surrounding the army that was surrounding Elijah it was it was God's host. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think in our daily lives, <clears throat> when we pray, you know, if we're in a for some reason, a state of fear because of the situation, a health fear or something. I think when we pray for the Lord to open our eyes and that He helps us to have that peace, it's because we have that spirit of protection yeah. around us. Right, yeah. And sometimes uh, believers are even allowed to see visually the spirit beings whom the Lord sends to the rescue, or at least as protectors, around those who ask for it. All right, so it was the Lord's uh, host who came to the rescue. And how can humans see spiritual beings if they're invisible? Oh, if God left them. Yeah. God can do that, right? Do, by the way, do spirits have bodies? They're different, not flesh. 
Well, sometimes. Sometimes, at least, <laughs> whenever they appear in scripture, although David had found one exception to what I said last time, they do appear in human form, without wings. All right, what did you bring away, uh, any of you, what did you take away from the, the chapter you read in the book or from the scriptures that we've just interacted with that you found was particularly helpful or a new insight? I believe in what the Bible says. Okay. It's true. All right. There's a lot of stuff going on that we can't see. There is a lot, yeah. And just because we can't see it, does it does it mean that it's not there? That's true. Well, it tells us there is a lot of spiritual battles. We have to recognize sometimes when we're in a spiritual battle. Yeah, yeah, we are. We, as the scripture, New Testament says, we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, authorities, rulers, and the cosmocrats in in the heavenly realm. Outside information uh, can help explain the what you're reading and you're not quite sure. The, right. For example, your explanation of Enoch that our people, uh, the writers used uh, in, in the uh, made, oh, that's helpful to know what that really means because it's another form of information. Right, yeah. Well, as we proceed, I hope that it will become more familiar and natural or supernatural for us Christians to engage the spirit world in our prayers. I didn't say try to communicate with them, but we engaged them in battle. All right, for next time, uh, as you're reading your Bible, at any passage this week, just look out for the, any mention of God's angels, demons, spiritual beings. Read chapter two in the book Supernatural, along with the cited Bible passages. And uh, we also recommend the bigger book, uh, The Unseen Realm,